to have a, a great week. In just a few moments, we get to hear from our friend and faculty member, uh, Brother Tony Brown. So we're looking forward to that in just a moment. Uh, no doubt a word from the Lord. Did they give you a hand, man? That's great. I want to read from Psalm 15 as our call to worship this morning. It says, O oh Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right, who speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, and who ties a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest, who does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never fall. You know, the Bible talks about more and more is the state of our heart before God. things that are true and to walk according to the obedience of God's word. Let's pray together and then our chapel attendants will come. Father, this morning we're grateful to be able to gather together as the body of Christ in this school representing churches from all over this community and we are thankful to get to hear from Brother Tony in just a few moments. Thank you for all that he means to, to the school and to us as a family member and a friend and Lord, I pray that in these next few moments, you would help us to understand what it means to have a pure heart, to walk in your truth, to do so under the power of your spirit. And Lord, it's my prayer, as it always is, for all of us here at Legacy, if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, may today be the day of salvation. Help us to look to you for everything. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together for our chapel pledges this morning. To the American flag, attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and with liberty and justice for all. To the Christian flag, attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for his kingdom it stands, one Savior crucified risen and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. To the Bible, attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Today's scripture will be coming from Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not confirmed to this world, and must be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for getting everybody here safely, and I hope everyone has a great day. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, students. It's so good to see your smiling faces this morning. We are going to have a special worship session this morning, and you all should know these songs, at least the first through sixth graders. They have been learning some old hymns. So you all sing them out. You know them. And everyone join in and worship this morning. So glad morning when this life is over.
our heads, let's pray. We have the blessing of having our first place beta performing team to come and share with us what they shared at um, the state convention via video, not in person. But we're so proud of them and excited for them to go to national. So let's pray as they come. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much, Lord, that we can be washed in the blood. Lord, thank you for the cleansing power that Jesus offered us on the cross. Lord, thank you that you welcome us to come into your presence today, to hear your word, to draw closer to you. And I pray that we would do just that this morning, that our ears would be open, our heart would be in tune to the things of God, and Lord, that you would work within us to draw us closer to your side. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. We all heard all mess up we all sin whether that be lying cussing pornography or gossiping we all mess up we all sin and we all deserve hell it says in Romans 3 23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God Romans 6 23 says for the wages of sin is death but there is hope my sin was dead was deeper. My shame was wide. Your arms are wider. My guilt was vain. Your love was greater still. But who, who is this man that can bring us joy and hope and peace everlasting? His name is she. Thank you, Beta. 
What about Miss Drake on the drums earlier? Where is she, Miss Frank? Yeah. You have to get up here more often now, Miss Drake. Hopefully, as, since this is chapel, you have your copies of God's Word in front of you. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 7. I'm, and I'm going to attempt today to take an Old Testament story that we're all familiar with, Noah's Ark, and take it and show how even in the Old Testament we have pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis chapter 7. Well, I'll begin reading in verse number 1. I'll be reading from the Holman Christian Standard. And if you want to know what that means, that means hardcore Southern Baptist, all right? Genesis chapter 7, beginning in verse number 1. Notice what God's word says. Then the Lord said to Noah, enter the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. You are to take with you seven pairs, a male and its female, of all the clean animals, and two of the animals that are not clean, a male and its female. And seven pairs, male and female, the birds of the sky, in order to keep all spring alive on the face of the hill earth. Seven days from now I will make it rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights. And I will wipe off from the face of the earth every living thing that I have made. And Noah did everything that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood came and the water covered the earth. So Noah, his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives entered the ark because of the waters of the flood. From the clean animals, unclean animals, birds, and every creature that crawls on the ground, two of each, male and female, entered the ark with Noah, just as God had commanded him. Seven days later, the waters of the flood came on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the sources of the watery depths burst open. The floodgates of the sky were open, and the rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On that same day, Noah, along with his sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's wife and his three sons' wives, entered the ark with him. They entered it with all the wildlife according to their kinds, all livestock according to their kinds, the creatures that crawl on the earth according to their kinds, all birds, every fowl, everything with wings according to their kinds. Two of all flesh that has the breath of life in it entered the ark with Noah. Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered just as God had commanded him. Then the Lord shut him in. Now before us is a story that's a true story. It was a real boat, but yet you look at science today and science says it really didn't happen. There could have been a flood because we all evolved. Let me just tell you how we can prove that it really happened. Over 200 cultures have the story of Noah's Ark recorded in their culture. All of them are similar to the biblical account. So that tells me all of them cannot be wrong. The Bible must be true. Not only that, but in 2014, some archaeologists discovered clay tablets, and they translated the clay tablets. And these tablets tell us that there was a boat that carried animals two by two, just like the Genesis account. Real boat, but it also pictures Christ. Here's how we can say that it pictures Christ. We can look at the sanctuary of this boat. Think about it. The, the ark must have been an unusual sight as it sat there in ancient Mesopotamia. Noah, who had never heard the word rain, was told by God, I'm going to destroy the earth because of the wickedness of man. I'm going to send a flood. I want you to build a boat. Here are the measurements. Here are the materials. I can just imagine Noah not having a clue what he was being told, but yet God told him, and he listened, and he obeyed us for 120 years. He and his sons built a boat that he never dreamed he'd build. And the Bible tells us that, that he preached that there was going to be torrential rains and a terrible flood coming upon the earth. People all around him probably thought he was insane. The ark was to be a sanctuary against the storm of wrath that was coming. How do we know that? Well, God, in Genesis chapter 6, God looked upon the earth. And he saw some things that greatly disturbed him. The Bible tells us that there was an intermarriage between the godly line of Seth and the ungodly offspring of Cain, which would have perverted the bloodline of the soon coming Messiah. 
In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, the Bible says that God looked down at the wickedness of men and knew that they were hopelessly in need of transformation. Matter of fact, the Bible even you, you, it says this, that God repented that he even made man. That word repent is not the same word that we use, that we have to repent in order to be saved. And as a result of being saved, it just means that God at that point wished he had never made man because of the wickedness. And then the Bible says also in Genesis 6 that God looked at man and saw that man had ruined the earth and that he was unjust and that he was violent. And so God decided he was going to wipe out the earth. And so he tells Noah to build this boat, certain dimensions, gather a certain amount of animals, and he builds a boat that pictures the Lord Jesus. Here's how it pictures Christ. It pictures in its substance. The Bible says he used gopher wood. Gopher wood is almost indestructible, very durable. It will not rot. All throughout Scripture, wood is a picture of humanity. And it pictures the humanity of the Lord Jesus. Jesus left heaven to come to earth, put on human flesh in order to reveal himself with us, to identify with us, and ultimately to die for us. Not only that, but wood also pictures the cross that Christ died upon. It also pictures Jesus and its security. Because the Bible tells us that after he, part of the instructions that Noah was told that after he built the ark, he was to cover it with pitch the wood itself was not going to float it needed some pitch that same word translated pitch is used 70 other times in the Old Testament and all those other times it's translated the word atonement pitch was a cover that would help the boat not get water on the inside the wood alone could not float pitch had to cover it you think about that, the atonement. When Jesus went to the cross, he shed his blood to cover our sins. You see, it was not the humanity or the life of Jesus that saves us. It's his death and the shedding of his blood. And it's the blood that seals us and keeps us safe from the wrath to come. But then we also think about the size of the ark. So many feet long, so many feet high, so many feet wide. If you do the math, that's about 3 billion cubic feet of space. Plenty enough to hold all the animals and all that were going to be on the ark. That reminds me of this, that Jesus Christ is sufficient enough that all those who will come to Christ, he will receive. Its shape gives us a picture of Christ. It didn't look like an ordinary boat. It looked like a floating coffin, which reminds us that Jesus died for our sins. And when we receive him, we die to ourselves. Its structure also gives us a picture of Christ. The ark had one door. It had one window. It had three stories. Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man can come to the Father but through me. Jesus is that door. There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, and his name is Jesus. And you think about the window. The window was so high. In order for us to be saved, we have to humble ourselves and get low and look up to the God of heaven and receive his grace and his mercy. And then you think about the three stories that reminds us that salvation is the work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who initiates that work of salvation and we receive it by faith. Then you think about its substance. Noah been on the boat as long as he was, he and his family and all those animals. They had to have enough stuff to keep them all that time. And the Bible tells us that he had everything on the ark that he needed which reminds us that Jesus Christ is all we need at your age you may think there are a lot of things that you want in life that may give you satisfaction and I'll just go ahead and tell you, you can try those things but it's not going to last Jesus is the only person that can satisfy 
Jesus is the only person that can take the void in your life and fill it to complete satisfaction. We also see Jesus in its schedule. For the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 8 that the ark came to rest on the 17th day of the seventh month. Now this means, obviously the Hebrew calendar, that the seventh month is when Passover normally takes place. We get to the New Testament. We know that just prior to Jesus going to the cross, he celebrated Passover with his disciples. And then he goes to the cross and he dies. And then the Bible tells us that the, on the 14th day of the seventh month, the ark rested. Well, you do, or the 17th day, rather, of the seventh month. You look at the 17th day, three days from the 14th day, that would picture when Jesus rose again from the grave. So you look at the ark, you see a perfect picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also see a picture of Jesus in its supply. Noah's name literally means rest. In Jesus, we find our rest. The Bible tells us if we know the Lord Jesus, that one day we're going to go to a place called heaven. And heaven, there are no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow. We will be resting in Jesus. But then I also want you to think about the sovereignty that we find in the ark. You see, the ark was not Noah's idea. It was God's. If God had not spoken to Noah, he would have died in the flood just like everyone else. But yet in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, we find these words. But Noah found grace, or you can put the word favor in there. But Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord. God reached into Noah's darkness and extended grace to him. That's the same way with us. In the midst of our sin, in the midst of our darkness, God reaches down and extends his grace to us. Even though we don't deserve it, even though we can't earn it, he extends his grace and mercy to us and it's for us to receive. And then we think about the security in the ark. The Bible tells us after the animals got in the ark and after Noah and all of his family got in the ark that God shut the door and he sealed it. When Noah entered the ark, God told him, come on in, it's time to come. He's basically saying, come on in and I will be with you. And then he shuts the door of the ark. And so Noah and his family on the inside of the ark looking out and the rest of the world's on the outside looking in God controlled the door and determined who was in and who was out he sealed them in let me tell you something when God shut the door the only way Noah would have got out is for God to open that door it's the same way with us when we give a heart and life to Lord Jesus Christ he opens the door we come in And he seals that door. And we're sealed until the day of redemption. There's only one way. Jesus. Just as Noah. Had only one way. To survive the flood. And survive the wrath. There's only one way you and I. Can survive the wrath to come. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this question this morning. Have you ever had a time in your life where you asked Christ to come into your heart and life to be your Lord, Master, and Savior? You may be thinking, well, I don't need to do that. I go to a Christian school or I go to such and such church. That doesn't matter. Every single one of us here, we're sinners. Every single one of us, we're in need of a Savior. We are responsible to God ourselves. We are accountable to God ourselves. So as an individual, have you ever asked Christ into your heart? Because if you haven't, today will be a great day as God opens the door of the ark for you to enter in and receive what he has for you. Let's pray together.
Father God, we come before you. We pray that, that through the raspiness of my voice today that your message went with clarity. We pray that your Holy Spirit took your word and pierced our hearts. And God, we pray there could be one here today that does not know you. That today they'll open up their heart as your Holy Spirit draws, as your Holy Spirit convicts. And they'll receive you unto themselves and become a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen.